Warning, the podcast you're about to listen to may contain graphic descriptions of violent assaults, murder, and adult language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast. One Night, Five Murders, Part 2. Well, David, episode one was certainly crazy, wasn't it? Absolutely. I really think people were probably surprised by some of the details that they've never heard before in that. Well, why don't you tell us, since we're coming up on One Night, Five Murders, Part Two, what we can expect? Well, we're going to finish this really interesting conversation with Fran, who is the lead investigator. That's Fran Root. And what they're about to hear in this episode is he's going to go into a little more detail about the evidence that was gained specifically some of the information that came from the autopsies, since we had five people that ended up dying from this. He's also going to go into detail about what it's like to prepare for trial for something of this magnitude, because you're talking about several defense attorneys. You're talking about a a tight court calendar, and he gets to speak to what it's like to work with Ray, the DA, who's been on this show a few times before himself, about the intensity of that trial preparation. We're also going to talk about the victim advocacy angle, which is something on this podcast that we really work hard on. And Fran's going to spend some time about what it's like to work with these people and work with these surviving victims. And I think people will find that interesting as well. All right. Well, with that being said, let's lead right on into part two. Let's do. Was it ever figured out why they were choosing new locations instead of everybody at the same location where they had them? No. You know, and oftentimes crime just doesn't make sense. You know, this was a murder spree conducted by two women that were under the influence of of drugs and alcohol, and it doesn't have to make sense. Well, after a a short break, the morning of the murders, uh, I met with the two associate chief medical examiners down at the University of Kentucky Medical Centers where they provided autopsies at that time. And so uh, Dr. George Nichols and Dr. John Hunsaker were there. We briefed them as to what we found out at the scene. And remember that Dr. Hunsaker had been out at the first scene. And I believe he made it to the second one as well. I don't recall him being at Squire's Row, but it was just more of the same, really. So uh, he had a good idea what the background was, and we found quite a bit of evidence. You know, these uh, identically spaced knife wounds, very low caliber, uh, basically junk ammunition being fired out of what they would call back then a Saturday night special that apparently kept falling apart on them, that had a yoke that the ejection pin would go through, and that's what would hold the revolver together, and apparently the retention wasn't worth anything on on that yoke or ejector, whichever one you want to call it, Uh, and it kept on falling out because we we found that in in one of the defendant's pockets where the gun was left at the scene. So that that caused many misfires and, and very ineffective type wounds. Ever recover a knife? Yes, we did. And once again, it, it was identical to a, the buck folding hunter of, of the time. I mean, it was a very popular knife at the time because it was the kind that you could work on and, and flip it open pretty quickly, uh, readily. And it would have a large three and a half to four inch blade on it. And, but this one is, and like I say, I'd never seen one of, again or, or before that. Uh, had a secondary, more traditional blade, not not the folding hunter type of blade, but that would extend out the same at end of the knife hilt. Because when you were describing it, I was thinking butterfly knife, or when we first started, I'm mm-hmm. trying to get how you get those two lateral. Yeah, it was very on. unique yeah. because they were varying lengths and widths. I might have a, a sketch of it here somewhere. Yeah. I don't think I've got a picture of it. Gotcha. Did that come back to be one of the suspects, or was that actually one of the victim's knives? Well, what was interesting, uh, well, we got the knife off of Tina Powell, 
And when we ran blood on the knife, everybody's blood could be identified in part on the knife. Again, this is a pre-DNA, but uh, there, there was factors of both of the defendants and all five of the victims present on that knife. This knife was just drenched in blood, and it pu- pulled down in where the blades would go. And, and Tina had that on her, uh, that arrest? Yeah. Now, was Tina and LaFonda, were they just friends, or were they partners, or what was their s- situation? I don't know that anybody knows for sure. I've been asked that many times over the years uh, if they were perhaps lovers. While both of them would turn tricks, and they certainly run together all the time, I don't know that there was any sexual connection between the two. So these two were certainly having sexual affairs with these male victims, like you said, in exchange for money or or drugs. And the ladies just got in the way, I guess, the other, your female victims? Well, the like I said, uh, Carlos Kearns' wife, Virginia, got fed up with the ripping off. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that that's what I think got the whole ball rolling. We did uh, locate them earlier in the day before they started driving around in a car over behind the P-Rats off of Richmond Road, uh, where they approached at least one male offering sex for money. I still, I, I just am so impressed with the amount of information just coming from so many different sources. And that, that when you described it, I liked hearing it too, because it emphasizes why people need to understand it. They can have what seems like a small piece of information that's insignificant, but what it means to the investigators is incredible. Oh, that's absolutely true. And I I think that reinforces that so much that nothing is really tiny in this game. Well, and and we had, the uh, once again, a a little piece of luck in that many people knew the defendants so they could readily identify them. LaFonda Fay is a significantly bigger woman with bright red hair. You know, big shoulders, and Tina Hickey Powell's quite a bit smaller brunette. So it was kind of a Mutt and Jeff type of thing that, oh, yeah, I saw, saw those two. It, it did help us put some of it together. Of course, now some of their associates weren't the kind that, that would readily talk to the police. But I think the fact that there was uh, the five homicides, and, and they probably also whoever would know LaFonda and Tina, they would also know the other five. So it it made them come forth with the information without too much trouble on our part. And when they were located that evening, what were they charged with initially that night? Just alcohol intoxication. So how did they explain all this blood on them that they were cleaning off? Oh, they wouldn't talk to us. Comes back to that where they invoked their rights. Yeah, they invoked their rights, so they wouldn't talk to us, so... We knew we and and we placed uh, one count of murder against each of them uh, that night to make sure that they didn't bail out or just get let out off, off of the AI charge. Now, despite the uh, mix up with the clothing that you yeah. talked about, which was a unfortunately those things happen, I guess. Was there anything? And I think you talked about how you had some statements out of the jail when you were hunting that down. Was there anything else that came from that booking process or that jail process that helped the case? The biggest thing that helped the case was the video recording and audio recording of the two women at the time that they were booked. We knew that the alcohol intoxication would and could come up uh, in trial as a defense. So that tape was shown to the jury many times, and what it what it showed was two belligerent but happy kind of people. LaFonda got very belligerent with the detectives that were there and asking them what they were doing there and, and the like. And they were obviously not falling down, not crazy, wild on drugs or alcohol. We'll have to put that video on the uh, show notes. I think the audience might yeah, get a kick out of that. Well, but so the people listening, don't forget if you go to murderpolicepodcast.com and click show notes for this case, is I'll put those videos on there and you can take a look for yourself and see. That's handy stuff. That's handy stuff. I remember I had a case one time where intoxication came up, but unfortunately in the interview room, the box, as we called it in the last Umi Southworth, is that the guy was demonstrating the assault and was actually at one point standing on one leg perfectly like a something out of a Karate Kid movie. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, wasn't swaying. And it came in, we used that in that case to show that, no, he wasn't inebriated or he couldn't have got on one leg like that. But it's uh, that stuff's kind of handy. I couldn't do that sober. No, no, not, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. No. So I guess so we you you did put that one charge on him, had enough probable cause on that. How's this work now moving toward? All this fantastic information, all the, the legwork is incredible in this. I never knew all that, even from a little bit I heard about the case before. How do we move into the the arena of the prosecution then? How do we how do we get to that point where we get them in custody and now it's time to see if we can convict them? Well, obviously our collaboration with the Commonwealth's attorney's office happened just immediately. And like I said, I had called him to the scene and I had also called him and notified him of uh, the other crime scenes as as we located them. We worked in conjunction. We developed what we thought could or would be uh, exculpable uh, evidence uh, that the defense might want to use. At that time, the Commonwealth's attorney's office would not plea bargain homicides, uh, unless, of course, they wanted to plea to the max, which never happened because they didn't have an advantage there. So... Uh, but when you talk about exculpable, let's talk about what that is for the audience and what the obligations are around that. Well, the obvious uh, exculpable information that, that we knew of was that they were charged with being drunk in a public place out to the Humana Hospital. So were they? we can anticipate from that that they will try to say they were out of their minds. That could, in fact, lower their culpability from a Class A crimes, or in this case, capital crimes, down to maybe Class B or C felonies. I think it's good to cover it, too, because of the obligation we have on that. Oh, yes. I, I know a lot of people watch a lot of documentaries where cases are reversed or thrown out, and if they're paying attention, most of them I've seen is because somewhere on the prosecution side, either uh, the police or the prosecution or a combination, somebody withholds that exculpable evidence, which is a cardinal sin. And that's why the case is usually reversed and probably ought to be, too, is that you're not allowed to hold things back just because they don't they don't fare well for what your case is. Your theory. Exactly. And we were in the habit of uh, not only avoiding holding anything back, but we would want to identify it right then and there and deal with it. Uh, right then and there. So, we, you know, it was it was kind of like when you get trouble at, at a grade school or an elementary school and, you know, the teacher's going to call your parents and you haul your chubby little butt on down the street real quick so you can tell them first <laughs> because you, you don't want the teacher to tell them first or make it look like you're hiding anything. And I think that's the same way in, with this kind of evidence. You're much better off Treating yourself and the investigation as a neutral finding of facts that you as an officer of the court are presenting to the, to the judge and the jury and uh, let them weigh what the evidence tells them. The yeah, excellent attitude. So where do we go from here? Right? It, we've got them in custody on a murder and we're, you've got kind of a theory, I guess, that you're going through. How does it start to work through on the trial strategy and, and what the trial looked like? You know, this is one of my first uh, jury trials with uh, Ray Larson, the, the Commonwealth attorney. And we got to be pretty close. 1985 is when he got elected or appointed, I think it was, to that job. 1985 was the year I got promoted, and we would had five homicides throughout the whole year. And here we have five homicides in one night uh, for, uh, I think it was a total of 26. Which is no longer the record, of course. Uh, Lexington's grown quite a bit since then. But once again, this is one of the first uh, trials, big trials I went to through with, with Ray Larson. And he called me like on a Saturday night at home. I'm off duty. And, and uh, he says, and, and you know the way he is, is Francis, let's uh, start getting this case ready to go to trial. And now this is. This is at a time in 1986 that you got to trial within six months to a year. Uh, now I understand that's, that's virtually impossible, that it's put off for years at a time. So, that, I mean, that, and that's a huge advantage. Uh, you're not having to rework the case two and three times to get ready for trial. 
So, Francis, let's, let's come in a little bit early here on, on Monday, and we'll start working on this case. Said, okay, Ray, you thinking about seven or so? He says, no, I was thinking about four or so. And, uh, and that's why I first learned just how intense he, he was on preparing for a case. But I tell you, I've never worked for anybody better. Uh, you knew exactly not only what he wanted and w- would perhaps be asking you, but he would also help you anticipate what the defense attorneys, in this case, there was, there was five or six of them, could want to ask you. So uh, you were thoroughly prepared. You felt confident going in. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, we've probably all had that before on some maybe lesser cases where you didn't even meet the uh, prosecuting attorney until you came with your subpoena in hand and I won't took the stand. I mention any names. No, but, but <laughs> yeah. That's terrifying. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, you feel like, and, and usually it was my experience, the results weren't exactly great. And, but and it makes you grateful when you work with somebody that will help make sure that you're prepared and what to expect. Yeah. Remind me to tell you a yeah. little vignette after <laughs> exactly. this. Exactly. Yeah. I'm thinking of some dudes. <laughs> Good deal. So what kind of stuff did you do at four in the morning to, to get ready for it? You started mapping out the case. In, in this case, Ray's famous butcher block paper it comes in thousand foot rolls. And uh, he had very large tables in, in his work area, his library area of, of the Commonwealth Attorney's Office. And you would lay that out and get a magic marker and Start marking it up on, you know, you would deal with what the evidence was and where it was located, but you'd also deal with the timeline, where were they spotted uh, and and who were they with and those type of things. And pretty soon you find that it gets put together. Now, more times than not, I get a fresh roll of paper because now you've changed, found out that certain things have happened uh, where you hadn't had it marked yet, so you would map it out again. Hey, Murder Police Podcast fans, it's David, and I wanted to take just a minute of your time to recommend three local podcasts from my area that I thoroughly enjoy, and I think you'll enjoy them too. The first one is called the Speaking of Harvey podcast. It's from a friend of mine named Scott Harvey, and he speaks to the topic of public speaking and what it would be like to move a career in that direction. But he also talks a great deal of entrepreneurship, business startups, side gigs, things like that. And I would say that if you speak to groups of people for any reason, whether you're a teacher or a presenter or anything like that, give the Speaking of Harvey podcast a listen. You're going to walk away with a lot of really good tips and information from that one. The second one I want to recommend is the Uncommon History of the South podcast. It's a fantastic local Kentucky history podcast that offers details that are amazing about the Commonwealth of Kentucky. It's actually on my go-to list, and it's one of those podcasts for me personally that I wait for the next episode to come out. So give the Uncommon History of the South podcast a listen and see if you enjoy it too. The third one, and not the last one in any kind of order, is called the Lexington Podcast. And this is done by a brother and sister here in Lexington, Kentucky. And they do an excellent job of talking about the history of Lexington, Kentucky, and then they entertain the contemporary lifestyle and things going on in Lexington, Kentucky. Excellently recorded, excellently produced. The content is amazing. It's another one that you'll really enjoy listening to. As a matter of fact, they actually covered the Michael Turpin murder and did it wonderfully. And they've actually done a real good job on covering a book called The Bluegrass Conspiracy. And for those from the Kentucky area, you know what that's about. And Erica and Jonathan do great justice to covering that. That's it. We'll get back to the show, but I wanted to recommend those to you. Thank you. I was going to say just even the chronology and the timeline, how much work goes into that, it, especially with five, because mm-hmm. the, the closer you can get to that, the better off you're going to feel going into it for any theory that you have with it, too. But it, it reminds me of accident reconstruction and some of the people that take that as a specialty. I, I couldn't do it because every time I pulled up the wreck, it looked like a spaghetti mess. And I, But to have that ability to kind of think linearly to get that put back together and then have the supporting facts, like you said, to be able to say that we believe that they were probably, that this, at least in this order of five people dying, what the potential order was. That's incredible work. Well, and I think also with all five of them potentially being killed at the same location and transported to different locations, that within itself was, it sounds like it was just horrendous to figure out 
what happened first and were they killed there? And in the incident of the one gentleman, you know, he didn't die at the scene. So there was a lot of detail that went into to that chronological outlay, I would think. Well, in, in most cases, you just cannot answer all the questions. And I, if it's presented right to the jury and or judge, they're going to understand that. You know, these women were on a wild spree. They had been drinking. They were running all over town and, and killing all these people. It doesn't have to make sense. Uh, all you got to do is prove that they did it, and they did it intentionally. And because it was multiple murder like it was, it qualified as a capital offense. And I'm sure in the jury's mind, a big aggravator would probably be that torment. Mm -hmm. It's uh, just like torture. You know, we look at it in the news and we think, okay, they got killed. And you might probably make an assumption that they were murdered there. But just to be able to tell the story that someone were probably put back in that car injured mm -hmm. and taken to a place after watching what happened, that, that, the, that has to have a profound effect. And again, you can't get that to the jury unless you can put those pieces together. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it is obvious that several, at least the male Dan Virginia are victims, uh, they, they knew what was going to happen. You know, they, they had already been injured. Can you imagine having a 22 caliber bullet bounce off your skull? It's still going to be quite a bit of pain, perhaps unconsciousness and, and other, uh, Parts of that, you're all already bleeding out from knife wounds and bullet wounds and uh, just waiting for your turn to die. When you got into trial, did you, was it a substantial witness list? Did they put a lot of people on to talk about all these bits and pieces of the puzzle? Yes, because we had so many bits and pieces. We, over the course of this, we uh, executed four search warrants. Two court orders, uh, and those were for the perk kits or the samples of hair and saliva and blood from, from the two defendants. And uh, 17 detectives worked on it off and on, uh, virtually full time for three weeks. And we ended up with 142 names on the witness list and uh, had 187 items entered into evidence. Exhaustive. Oh, yes. Exhaustive. But it takes that to, to paint that picture. Were any of these witnesses that were on your witness list, were they surprised by this? Or did they kind of see the writing on the wall with these two women that they were certainly capable of this? Uh, you know, the witnesses, not so much because it just, the crime kind of spoke for itself, you know, and, and plus LaFonda's reputation. So they know, probably weren't totally surprised that no, she had done this. No. A dumb question. I'm going to assume neither one of them testified either. You know, I think, I don't recall for sure, but I'm thinking in penalty phase that uh -huh. Tina tried to put it all on LaFonda, that she was afraid that LaFonda would kill her if she didn't go along with the program. Well, let's talk about that here in Kentucky, because people may not be familiar. You said penalty phase. How many phases do we have to this to get to the point where somebody's put up or... Well, trials at, at, at this level, at, at the felony level, are, are bifurcated. Uh, in other words, the jury is asked to determine whether the defendants are guilty or not guilty, or possibly guilty of a lesser offense. But in, And there's only so much you can only enter information about the particular crime that you're trying during that stage. But then you enter into a penalty phase before the entire same jury, and that's where you can talk about records and uh, victims can speak and say what the crimes have done to their lives. And then the jury goes back out again to determine what the appropriate sentence would be and make that recommendation to the judge who ultimately has the final Good to know. Say. I like covering that because it's a different show. Yes, and, and just is. like you talked about, the victims have a little more rights in it, too, is that I've always said that that's where the real Bible thumping starts and the uh, salvation of souls and, and all that happens. And I've even seen pictures of a suspect that brutally murdered somebody when he was seven years old digging a well, and that was a redeeming factor. So it, it's a different show for sure. It is, and, and especially is when it comes to victims' rights. In general, I'd say through my whole career, and I, I would have been 12 years into my career, 
at that point, we were just really, the police department were just really starting to pick up on seeing to the victims and the survivors. And Ray Larson, when, when he started, saw to it, uh, actually hired people full time to, to be victims advocates. And, and we subsequently did a much better job from there on out. It's a very commendable work because to have somebody thrown and thrust into that, that's a dark, scary system. And oh, yeah. None of it makes sense to people. That's it to this day. Some of it doesn't make sense to me. But mm-hmm. but for has somebody to, to have that loss of their loved one or that friend compounded with a, a system that kind of cruises by them, I think that's a good move. And a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that by giving victim rights, you're taking rights away from a defendant. And that's that's so far from the truth. You know, the Constitution has got got that covered very well. And mm-hmm. We even provide those defenses. But, you know, giving somebody the right to maybe talk about what that loved one meant to them or what the impact has been on their family, a jury needs to hear that before they make that decision. And that, that's the reality of where this is at. So that's interesting stuff. And, you know, you find uh, after you work with quite a few victims and survivors that uh, they, in fact, want to talk about it. Now, originally, at least in my mind, I, I would see the mother of, of a victim even years later and I'd be very reluctant to bring it up. But in fact, these people, most of these people want to talk about it and they appreciate the chance to, to uh, reminisce or, or to uh, at least just say what their feelings are. Well, and I think also to know that you worked so hard on the case for their loved one to get this conviction on on the suspects, um, you know, I'm sure they probably in some sort of way have that kind of bond, if you will, with you, knowing that you're who brought their their loved ones, killers to, to justice, if you will. Mm-hmm. Now, with these two suspects, were you all able to get all five murder convictions on them for each suspect? Oh, yeah. And was that a death row conviction for them? Uh, yes, I think they ended up giving the fond of the death penalty, five death penalties. And uh, Now, Tina did not get that? No, she got the the next highest sentence of life without the eligibility of a parole for 25 years. Well, why would her have, hers have not been the same as, uh, t- as LaFonda's? I think uh, she was successful in convincing the jury that she was there under some duress. And so these ladies are in Kentucky today still? Oh, yeah. Well, actually, LaFonda's been moved around I know several times out of states, uh, she was so much trouble, but I, I'm pretty sure they're both back. Is she still on death row or did that get No, that, that got, she uh, ended up, she won an appeal. It was one of those innocuous kind of things that the prosecutor shouldn't have said what he said or the way he said it. So we could have easily retried her, but this was some several years afterwards. And keep in mind that the people that we're using for witnesses on on this case uh, are a lot of them were drunks, uh, just uh, misdemeanors, and and uh, and several were quite old uh, and either moved away, were unlocatable, or died. So uh, Ray did let her plea uh, to get the death penalty off of her to life without parole. Well, I think as a victim's family, if they had any you know, still around at that time. Because I know most of your victims were quite older. I think that would be really quite offensive to me, knowing that you're supposed to get the death penalty and you don't. Mm-hmm. Well, that happens all too often. I've, uh, I've obtained, uh, I've, heard, I've lost count actually, but I think around eight death penalties and uh, one, only one defendant, but he died of natural causes on death row. All the rest were overturned and then plead to something else. And they they look at death penalties with such scrutiny, which I don't know that I can argue with, uh, but they will use some very minor glitches to, to demand a retrial. And maybe that's the way it ought to be. Yeah, I think the scrutiny, I don't have a problem with that. I think the but I've always put myself in a place of a juror. That is not easy. I've met some of them that have worked uh, death penalty cases after, you know, you do bump into them at, out in a restaurant. The amount of work and personal toll that takes to come to that decision, I've always thought, yeah, there's, there's a crummy side to that, too, that these people 
really did a civic duty that a lot of people try to avoid. Oh, yeah. And then they walk out of that room. And, and even if they give somebody 40 years, they really think, I've done justice for this surviving victim or their family. And then they find out they get out in seven. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, those are the kind of things that that's, they're just mind boggling and creates a lot of frustration in the system. Yeah, I don't think any of the jurors take lightly, especially a capital offense. Uh, I know it, it you know, leaves a lasting effect on them. I've known a few jurors that have sat on capital cases and, in fact, gave the death penalty, and, and they're changed for life. Did you ever have any more contact with any of the uh, family members, or is that all? No. You know, we, we just—there was a brother or two there, and— uh, well, I was going to say that I think that's what's neat about covering these cases is to create an oral history on those five people and and so that their names aren't forgotten because we're talking about 1986 and time mm-hmm. passes and some of them were older anyway. And there's that other that's another sadness to this, too, is the idea that they just kind of fade into the oblivion. And, you know, with this, that's well before Google and the Internet to where any information isn't isn't going to be available on them. So I think it's I'm grateful you for you coming in and spending the time to at least get their name out there again and to create a record somewhere of, of who they were to the best we know them. Yes. Because uh, uh, it really isn't about the two people that killed her, that people know them and that everybody calls, you know, the foster power. Everybody gets that. But remembering those people is equally important, too. Well, just like on these serial killings or mass murders that, that you get, I just assume they never mention the name of the perpetrator. Yeah. You know, because uh, so many of them are in it for for the fame of it mm-hmm. and to try to make a record or outdo the last one. And, and so the less they get mentioned, I think the better off everybody is. I agree for sure. Well, I'll tell you, friend, during your career, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, victim advocacy, which I'm a big proponent of. And one of the things we hope this uh, podcast does is make people aware of uh, victims and their needs and, and again, to create a, a living memory of the people they lost. Tell us a little bit about what it was like to work with those surviving families and what kind of relationships you built and what that meant to you as a homicide investigator. Well, it's... Really, as you mature and gain more experience and you start to pick up on just what a big deal this crime was to these survivors, that uh, and that's the word I like to use a lot is survivors, even though they're not a part of the assault or anything, but they've had to live through it. And, and in many cases, uh, they've been more traumatized than, than even the victim because they get to live with it for decades and decades. So I can certainly remember a time early on in my career when we weren't doing a very good job of keeping up with with victims or even to pay attention to them. I can remember uh, one barricaded person uh, situation that we were out for hours on, and nobody, everybody had jobs to do, but nobody assigned or just took up the job of dealing with the six family members that, that were out of the house. You know, this he had already killed his wife, but her sister and and both of their kids and and uh and I think a brother in law. The police never talked to them again really. I got to talk to them a couple of days afterwards when nobody was returning their calls and and, you know, they had clothing inside of the place that they needed to get for the kids and and food and things. And, and that was the first attention that they had gotten. And, you know, I came out over the weekend and had to go down to property and get a bunch of gas masks because you couldn't go into their house without wearing one and uh, let them in to, to collect what they needed to collect. And that meant a lot to them, but I don't know if it really got past how angered they were, they were over our inattention to begin with. So uh, that's almost impossible to make up for, you know. So, and I'm happy to say that over the past 30, 40 years, uh, we have gotten much better, and uh, victims do have rights, and the courts have recognized that, parole boards have recognized that, and it makes a, a difference to the families. 
Well, Fran, thank you so much for coming to share this story on the these five victims and this heinous crime by LaFonda Foster and Tina Powell. It was just as interesting as the last time you shared with us the uh, Michael Turpin case, which was also equally as horrific. But thank you for all the work you did on these cases, the hours you put in, and most importantly, thank you for coming to share them with us. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you all for doing important work. Well, thank you again. And I think we can tell the listeners we'll probably hear more from you here shortly. The Murder Police Podcast is hosted by Wendy and David Lyons and was created to honor the lives of crime victims so their names are never forgotten. It is produced, recorded, and edited by David Lyons. The Murder Police Podcast can be found on your favorite Apple or Android podcast platform as well as at murderpolicepodcast.com which is our website and it has show notes for imagery and audio and video files related to the cases you're going to hear. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn, and YouTube, which has closed caption available for those that are hearing impaired. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe for more and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast from. Subscribe to the Murder Police Podcast and set your player to automatically download new episodes so you get the new ones as soon as they drop. And please tell your friends. Lock it down, Judy.